good. It's 8 o'clock, time for our uh, pre-agenda to go over the uh, business that we're going to conduct today. Uh, I'll have the invocation today, uh, Pledge of Allegiance, Commissioner Darby. And then we have uh, the approval of the minutes. Uh, do we have any discussion on or any? No adjustments to the agenda this time. Okay. Then we have a uh, public hearing at 9 o'clock uh, on rezoning 1.22 acres at 439 and 453 Ruskin Road. Chairman, we have, uh, you missed number one, I'm sorry. You're right. To receive public comment on approved incentive for Project Daffodil Sanctuary Systems, uh, LLC, and that's the business, the new business that's coming to Fremont. Yes, sir, and uh, Mark Pope will be here at 9 as well. Okay, all right. That one's at 9 o'clock and the yes, other sir. one is at 9.30. Committee, Mr. Gurley, we have anything? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. We will, uh, we will uh, approve the ones that we submitted last uh, last meeting. Okay. Uh, consent agenda, Mr. Honeycutt, if you can go right. over that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first on the consent agenda is application for property tax exclusion. Uh, that has been uh, reviewed and recommended by staff. And then number two is budget amendments, and I'll turn that to Allison. Okay, your first budget amendment begins on page 29 of your agenda <clears throat> with the library. Budget amendment for $100, they received a donation to purchase history books, so we are appropriating those funds. You have another budget amendment for the library <clears throat> in the amount of $75,000. These are not new funds, this is a reallocation of funds that were appropriated earlier in the year. They had not yet determined the specific programs they wanted to spend that grant on, so they've now determined where that money's gonna be spent, so we are reallocating those funds to the correct line items. <clears throat> For the social services, this is also a reallocation in the amount of $11,200. DSS received um, CARES funding specifically for the DSS department. This is not part of our county allocation. Um, they are using part of these funds to purchase smart boards, and so we needed to reallocate that to the capital outlay line item, and that's what this budget amendment is doing. This money is just to pass through? Yes, sir. <clears throat> it sure is. Mr. Chair. If I can go back, I'm sorry, I'm a little slow this morning. Oh, no problem. If I can go back to 188. Yes. And under that grant, it's a Dudley grant, and I see a breakdown on that was 41660 for service and maintenance to open broadband. Are they expanding broadband at Dudley? Yes. Is yes. that what that is? Yes, sir. Yes, oh. sir. Well, that's good news. I mean, you know, but we kind of slipped through the cracks. We need to know that. <laughs> the equipment on one tower. Do I now? The equipment, on one the tower. equipment for one tower. And that's coming from a grant. Yes, yes sir. That, that's it's great news. Library. Okay, thank you. Sure. So, um, cover uh, 190, budget amendment 191. So now I am on page 36 with a budget amendment for the Board of Elections in the amount of $23,292. They also received CARES funding that was, that was separate from our county pot of money. So this is specifically to the Board of Elections. <clears throat> Um, again, when we first allocated these funds, they were not quite sure where the money was going to be spent. Some of this is because, and I've mentioned this on the CARES funds before, the regulations for CARES monies has kind of evolved. Um, it was sort of the money was put out there and then maybe the regulations on how that money could be spent changed after you received it. So um, they have allocated the funds and what they're doing here is reallocating to professional services. And this will cover um, the maintenance and support on the election system 
systems and software, and it will also cover utilities, housekeeping, sanitation, and after duty labor for the Maxwell Center for the election um, period. For EMS, we are requesting to uh, appropriate fund balance in the amount of $1,412.95. Um, these are funds that were appropriated in a former budget. <clears throat> For whatever reason, the invoice was not received until recently. Um, there were funds set aside um, in 18-19 fiscal year for the Fremont Junior Rescue Program, and all of those funds were not spent, and one of the invoices has just now been received. Um, I think part of this may have some something to do with some changeover in personnel, but at any rate, this is this was owed to this company, and um, they're paying that out. For solid waste, this budget amendment looks a little strange because we're actually increasing and decreasing out of the same line item in the amount of eighty three hundred dollars. Um, this is <clears throat> part of capital outlay um, that was requested and budgeted, and they had some savings from that in solid waste department. Um, typically, that savings cannot be reallocated to any other projects unless you specifically approve that. So um, the solid waste <coughs> department is, has had a bush hog that I believe is beyond repair at this point, and they are requesting to use the savings from that capital line item to pay for a new bush hog in the amount of $8,300. For the sheriff's office, they've received controlled substance tax monies in the amount of $312.97. And for your last budget amendment, we have one for the sheriff's office in the amount of $886.73. And this is for an insurance claim due to a deer accident to one of our vehicles. And that's all I have for you. There's no additional questions on budget amendments. Uh, number three is a motion to approve NCDOT petition to add Southeast Drive and Sanders Place to the state maintenance system. Uh, again, this is just something that we have to do. And I'll be, since Barry is the next five, I'll have Barry come up now. All right, thank you. The first item I have is a preliminary subdivision plat. Uh, this is for Drummersville Road Estates. <clears throat> this is out on, um, actually on Drummersville Road, uh, just south of NC55, just right outside of Seven Springs. Uh, it's actually not far from the Lenore County line. Uh, this is a kind of, the, the plat itself is a little uh, misconceiving because it's such a large area, but the lots are actually larger than what they appear. They're actually, the average lot size is 2.24 acres. So there's a large tract subdivision. Uh, they are doing road front lots uh, with shared driveways. Those shared driveways are actually being required by NCDOT um, for their driveway permit application process. Uh, the planning board has reviewed this request and does recommend approval. Um, and with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Page 55. Yeah, it, and really quick, with the shared driveways, DOT, um, as part of their driveway permit process, does require that those driveways, they are requiring that those driveways be installed um, up front, whereas typically in a uh, residential setting, um, the developer or the, the builder will put in a driveway when the home is built, but DOT does actually require that these shared driveways be installed before um, they will issue any sort of driveway permit or before they'll approve the final plat. So that's a little different than what we typically see. This is something new that DOT has started over the past several months. Uh, they have actually have some new guidance for road front lots that they have shared um, a couple of months ago. So we're seeing some new things here that we typically haven't seen before with just your typical road front lot subdivision. So. Harry, are the driveways bigger since they're shared? Typically, yeah. At the road, they are um, up at the right-of-way. And DOT does require that they be um, hard-surfaced 
and then once they enter into the lot, then they can branch off and <clears throat> have a large thing. The property owner wants them at that point. But really, it's just the part there at the road that has to be installed, the paved part, and then they can branch off how they want to and put whatever they want down once it gets into their property. So. And, and the shared driveway is for two parcels. That's right. And, and you know, so if there's, I don't know how many it is, if there's 16 parcels here, you're looking at eight driveways. That's right. Right. One for every two. That's right. So basically that alleviates turn lanes and stuff. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. And yes, and um, the traffic flow would probably control that on that road. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Chair, did I, I'm sorry, I can barely hear you. Did you say that the driveways have to be paved? Right, the um, DOT requires when they require shared driveways that they be hard surface paved or concrete at the right of way. But only on shared driveways? Only on are, shared driveways. They're right. not requiring that on individual driveways? That's correct, mm -hmm. they're not. Interesting. No, I asked DOT specifically, and they said they do require them to be hard surface for the shared. Yep. So you could asphalt them? That's right. Mm -hmm. Asphalt, asphalt or, or cement. Mm -hmm. Right. Concrete. Okay. Yep. Does it say what they are as far as footage? I mean, is it like, is it like 30 foot or is it? <clears throat> well, I'm just, I've got that information here. Yeah, at the road itself where it connects to the right of way, it's 50 feet. Okay. And then it tapers back to about 25 feet once it passes the right of way. Right away. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I see it now. Any more questions on that one? All right. If not, I'll go over to really quick the, the next item I have, which is a rezoning request. This is, um, we're actually requesting that you hold a public hearing next month. Um, <clears throat> this is an application um, from Baldwin Design Consultants, the property owners, Delmas Bridgers family. Uh, this is out on Highway 70 going um, west. Uh, towards Princeton. It's on the right there at Bridgers Road, if we're familiar with that area. Um, the rezoning, the, the current zoning actually is RA20. They're requesting it to be rezoned to community shopping or to CES. Uh, the site's about, it's a little less than an acre. Uh, it is surrounded by property owned by the same property owner that's requesting the rezoning. Uh, there is some community shopping across the street. Um, this is along the 70 corridor, so there is a mixture of community shopping and RA20 kind of scattered from one end to the other um, in various places. So it's not unusual to see community shopping along Highway 70 uh, directly on it. Uh, this has gone to the planning board and they do recommend approval. Uh, and we are asking that you just hold a public hearing February 2nd um, at 930. And we will, um, once you set that hearing, we will notify property owners, adjacent property owners, post the property and advertise in the paper as well. Any other questions on that one? Yeah. Right, thank you. All right, thanks, Bert. Uh, and then number six, motion to approve the conveyance of surplus property at 200 North Carolina Street, Goldsboro and 204 North Virginia Street, Goldsboro, uh, jointly owned by the county and the city. And I'll turn that to Andrew. Good morning. Um, this was a request from Jennifer Collins and Scott Satterfield with the city of Goldsboro. Um, I believe the DGDC has some plans for this block um, around North Carolina and North Virginia Street. The two properties were tax foreclosures that we uh, acquired within the last couple of years. They reached out to us probably about three or four weeks ago and asked us if we would convey our interest. So there were, when we foreclosed on the property, there were no bids. Um, so the county and the city submit the bid. 
Um, we, become, we became the highest bidders and then we won the auction. So we own that jointly with the city of Goldsboro. Um, and then the city has asked us if we would deed our interest over to them so they can develop the lots. Um, as it stands right now, both are vacant. Um, we've received no um, offers to purchase, and I don't believe the city has either. So um, a lot of times if, if the city has an interest in some of these downtown properties, we convey these properties over to them so they can develop them, maybe market them, or work with DG, DGDC to develop them. So that was the request on these. And I did put in the tax value in your agenda for each of them and the cost to acquire. The cost to acquire represents all the back taxes um, and then all the legal fees and that administrative fees, filing fees, everything that went into actually the foreclosure action itself. So you have all that information in front of you. That's in 60, uh, 65? Uh, 60, it starts on 60 in the agenda packet. Can we trade it for six tenths of an acre? <laughs> <laughs> My fault, exactly. Y'all uh. are, are paying me to say it. <laughs> have, have we um, reached out to any of the, the property owners nearby to see if they uh, had intentions on, on purchasing those properties? I haven't, and I don't know if the city has either. This was just a request from Jennifer Collins and Scott Chatterfield. So. I don't know if they're if they're working because as as you're aware the city has that special um, uh, local law where they can sell it to adjoining property owners yes. for a dollar. I, I don't know if they've reached out to them or not. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So before we, if we're if we're deeding it over to them, is that something that we need to know beforehand whether okay. they have talked to the adjoining property owners? Okay, that's fine. I mean, we can if you want, we can remove this from the. Consent agenda, yeah, I, can I think that would be best because if we don't know that information, we want to make sure we're doing things okay. the right way. Hey, Mr. Chairman, I'd also like to know kind of what their interest is in these properties because they're not adjoining and just kind of get some idea of what their interest is in it. Um, I mean, are they planning on selling the property? Do they have any interested buyers? Why all of a sudden would they have some interest in acquiring these properties? <laughs> I, is That's fine. I can follow up and get that information. We can take it off the consent agenda and then add it back on for your next meeting. Find out what's going on. Yes, sir. Oh. Uh, Mr. Neal, mm -hmm. the cost to acquire, which like on the first one is 8,808. Mm -hmm. um, is that our cost or is that half city, half us? Half. So we split that. So that re represents the back taxes. So that would be city taxes and county taxes. And then those legal fees are split with the county and the city. So when we foreclose um, and we end up owning the property, we bill the city for half of those administrative costs. So half the legal fees, half the filing fees and everything. So the city has paid these even mm -hmm. though we're donating the property? They have, yeah. Okay. They've been billed for these. Okay. We invoice them. We usually do that quarterly. Every three months or so after we go through a handful of sales, we'll run a list and then send it over to the city and invoice them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does that need to be voted on to remove it? Yes. Just, I'll adjust the adjustment when you go. Yeah, I'll, I'll make that adjustment during the um, uh, regular meeting. Okay. Thank you, and I'll follow up and get that information. Okay. Um, and then under new business, uh, presentation of emergency operation plan summary by emergency management coordinator Aaron Stryker and the National Incident Management System and Incident Command System. So we're asking you for two approvals. One will be uh, for the updated EOP plan. Uh, the second approval would be to follow the NIMS with respect to command and control during disasters. And that's kind of a standard uh, program that uh, the feds would like for us to use. So Aaron will be here as well to make that presentation. He's actually here now if they'd oh. like to hear from him now. Or oh, hey, Aaron. I'm sorry. We'll have to wait for these 9 o'clock. Yeah. Or we can do it now, or if you want to wait till 9, it's whatever you want to do. As you're the board. I just have a, 
You want to wait to nine? Yeah. Let's let's yeah let's wait to nine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then number two, motion to approve water request for bid and contract of cleaning and janitorial supplies to Seven Oak Supply. Uh, again, Noel is here as well, and I appreciate the work that Noel has done. Uh, I think this is the first time it's been bid out since ever. Yeah. So um, it, it's been a, a process with a committee and. Um, really very thorough so i do appreciate the work noel did on that as well Ms. trying to cut do we notice savings on the difference in what we had and what we're going for 35 about 28 000, yeah. about twenty eight thousand dollars um you should have in your packages yeah, um there is a little it might be a little confusing um to give you a little background information um Per general statutes, anything that we purchase over $90,000, we have to formally bid. And we've never bid this out before because we we purchase from them sometimes daily, sometimes weekly. Um, we really don't buy from them on a monthly basis. We buy from them on a weekly basis. So we really never looked at it as a whole. But when we went to look at it as a whole, we spent last year over $200,000 with them. And we we do use a local vendor here in town, Coastal Chemical. They've been a great vendor. But because of general statutes, we needed to bid it out. Um, we also, and once we did that, um, they weren't the lowest bidder. Um, we, um, our sheriff's department, our facilities department are the ones that buy from them. And if you'll see on your breakdown, I've gave, given you two breakdowns. One is all the bids. We received quite a few bids. But then I broke it down for the two lowest bids and the two bids that we received the most bids from because our goal is to buy from one vendor if possible. And um, if you'll notice on the very last page, it breaks out for you um, the the savings. And I, I did check just to see how much we had spent with them this year. And from July 1 till, na till about the middle of December, we've spent over a hundred over a hundred thousand dollars with them already um so um with coastal so it is definitely that we would need to bid it out we've spent a hundred and eleven thousand five hundred and seventy one dollars so far within this year so um right now an overall savings of about twenty eight thousand dollars but what we found when we did the bid was um we are actually using name brand products like for our hands our hand wash we're actually using gojo which is one of the most expensive name brand products there is they kind of revealed to us this new company that they can go through and give us commercial grade products that would probably do a job better and save us even more money so we're looking at a larger savings than just twenty eight thousand dollars there's also a lot of other areas that they have found that they could save us money in they have met with facilities they have met with the sheriff's office um, we we just kind of had an initial meeting because we were concerned because we have had Lee chemical right here in our back door we could run down there you know and this company is not local um, but they have assured us that they will stock our products for us and that they could give us our products within 48 hours so um, we feel like it's a good fit um, but we need your approval and and the nice thing about this as well, this is a year contract. So I think there has been some concern about the service that they can provide. So if we're not getting the service that we feel like and they're not being as responsive as we need, we can get out of it within a year. But they do specialize in municipalities and schools. Um, and so that is one reason why we look to them because they do this on a regular basis. And I also called references. They are utilized in Onslow County and a couple other counties and they had glowing recommendations. Do they have to, are we going to have to buy them bulk or, or is it just going to be on as needed? Um, they actually came and looked at our um, our inventory offices, you know, to see what where we stock it now. And they're going to actually hold the storage in their warehouse. And then um, they will bring us what we request for our storage. And then we will work out a, um, a delivery. I think they'll deliver on Mondays and Wednesdays and maybe Fridays. Possibly. And that's where we're at. Oh, 
at our a facility. Where, where are they from? That's what I'm saying. Oh, I'm sorry. They are from Hope Me. It's about two hours, two or three hours from here. Hope Mills, maybe. That's federal. Yeah. That's federal. That's federal. And I may be wrong about that. I had so many bid, right. <laughs> but I, I can tell you, I can get that for you, Mr. Chair. Um, when, excuse me, you said that um, that they said that they could change the chemicals from uh, different products to a commercial grade products. When did you talk to any of the other vendors about that as well? Yes, what we did now to make sure it was a fair bid, we actually bid exactly what we were we're using now because we wanted to make sure we were we were bidding apples to apples. So we took our inventory that we buy now and we had every vendor bid those. And if they couldn't bid that, we had them send in substitutions. But um, these two vendors bid it exactly what we actually use now. Honest. So I was just wondering, and my, my only issue with this is that we're taking from our local economy and putting it somewhere else when, you know, I don't know how many jobs that the current company would create off of that money that we're spending with them, and we're sending that money to somewhere else. So that would be my only problem that I have with it, you know. I mean, sometimes with saving money, we're damaging something also. So if we're, we might be losing a couple jobs locally over saving a few dollars, which our economy is already, you know, we're taking hits here because of everything else. It might turn around and take another hit because of this. So that's the major problem that I have with it. Mr. Chair. Thanks. <laughs> I'm glad to see that we are looking at ways to actually save dollars. Um, hopefully we'll find more ways that we can put these items out for bids. Um, and again, your other comment there in regards to this new supplier would actually provide products of like kind but not name brands. We all are shopping now and trying to find ways to save dollars by buying not name brand things sometimes, <coughs> but actually the same ingredients, same product as such, but in a store brand. So. Well, and one thing we also noticed, Mr. Dari, was we're using like Lysol and Fabuloso, and those things are like household chemicals, whereas they can give us commercial chemicals that are that are stronger and better, but won't won't hurt the environment, won't hurt anyone, and and possibly be ch and be cheaper as well. Um, also, um, we have talked to the vendor and explained to them that there will be emergency situations. There will be times where we have to go to Lee Chemical. So we are not totally not utilizing Lee Chemical. It's just um, on our regular orders, we would we are asking to approve this company, and we will still utilize Lee Chemical, just not to the extent extent that we have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other questions? Anyone else? Thank you, ma'am. And then number three is motion to approve temporary policy regarding paid COVID sick leave. Uh, basically, as you are aware, under the CARES Act, that the um, sick leave uh, granted the additional two weeks for COVID uh, was ended as of December 1. Uh, what this would do would be extend that federal program until March 31st, I believe. Um, Yes, March 31st. So this is an extension of, of that uh, federal program till March 31st. And this is a recommendation of staff? This recommendation of staff. Mr. Chair, <clears throat> as I expressed, I have some concerns on this. Um, I understand both sides of the equation. Uh, this emergency plan uh, and this sick leave policy is not available outside of county personnel, basically. Um, however, we are facing a, a real situation here, uh, and I have withheld any objection uh, as long as that is for a 
90-day period of time and would actually end the end of March. So. And, and again, and Andrew, I um, want to make sure I'm qualified. This is voluntary for the county. We do not have to do this. Uh, this is an extension of the federal program, um, but this is voluntary for the county to do and to move forward with either to approve or not. Mr. So on the, if an employee, an employee has already had COVID and been out for those at 10 days, you, you get one shot at it. All right. Yes, sir. And, and that's that, that. That's basically. They don't. They don't re up. It's just a. Okay. Yes, sir. So, I mean, yeah. It, it, it's a one time uh, uh, shot under it, and, and that would not change. Yes, sir. Mr. Chair, um, my question is, that one time shot was that from past to present, or will that one time shot start again from? Uh, from today? past to now. Okay. So during the, the, the time of uh, that the initial um, uh, leave was granted by the feds. Um, so, so for that, I guess it'll be a, a, almost a nine month period. Mm -hmm. you, you get that one time uh, uh, 10 days. The uh, only problem I have with that is that if you know if an employee gets sick on the job, then what's, you know, you don't, you don't get that same benefit, but you're getting sick on the job. You know, I mean, some of our EMS and, and firefighters and sheriffs, they go into homes, they go into situations that the average worker might not have to go into. So now you're saying that, well, because I've had it before, that I don't get it again, but I could be even sicker this time than what I was the first time. So that's, that's the issue for me. And then second is, you know, will we readdress this in March? Because there's no deadline on saying this pandemic is gonna end in March. And, and to look at it, it's nowhere near ending in March. So will we come back and, and look at it again then because it's still gonna be the same situation. So are we gonna say, well, if you get sick, so what? You know, or are we gonna say, okay, we're gonna go back and look at it, then we'll adjust it another 90 days or whatever, considering what's going on in, in the world. You know, so those would be my, my two issues that I have because, you know, you can't say because the person gets sick one time that they're not going to get sick again. That's nowhere, nowhere found. Like, oh, okay, well, you got it once, you're not going to get it again. That's, I mean, yeah, your body does build up antibodies and you do, you can fight it off, but that just depends on each person. So each person is different. So those would be the two issues that I have with it. Yes, Mr. Tiny Good, this pertains just to COVID. This just to cope. This just is COVID. if is, somebody is there any, is, there any, is, is there any figures anywhere that you that someone has had COVID more than once. I think I have read that there are some occasions that there have some, uh, and, and again, this internet. So, um, but, um, I mean, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like saying, yeah, yeah. So but it's like I, saying you can't yeah. get a you can't yeah. get a cold twice, yeah, right? You, or you can't get the flu twice. You know what right. I mean? You can get a flu shot, right. still get the flu. Right. You know what I mean? Which we don't we we don't know right. enough even about it right now to even know what's what's what the future holds, or if you can't get it twice, you can't get it twice. We don't know any of that just yet. Yes, sir. So, I just think that. You know, it's kind of sort of, it's, it's a gray area there. And I mean, we're kind of sort of putting our employees out on the limb with that one, if if that's the case. And if they get, if they do test positive, we don't want them being forced to come to work and then get somebody else sick that may have already had it, haven't had it or whatever. So then you're running a risk there. Because if I know if I'm home and I have to pay my bills and the only way to pay those bills is for me to go to work, I'm gonna get up and go. I might not have the symptoms, but I tested positive and I feel okay. So now it's like, oh, well, I'm going to work. Now I get somebody, somebody else catches it for me and they get really, really sick. They get hospitalized or even deaf. So, you know, that's a lot of risk there for, you know, money. And sometimes we have to put money to the side and think about, you know, the health and, and the well-being of others over money. But this, this is by, by federal guidelines. This is just basically extending uh, what we did before under the federal guidelines, um, where that program ended December uh, 31st. And Andrew, you want to? It's a little bit different. Well, that's the sheriff and, yeah. yeah. Maybe wait, we can do it. Yeah, we yeah. can do it at nine. Okay, all right. Yeah. Mr. Uh, Honeycutt, is yes, this sir. some of the money we're gonna use that we put in uh, payroll, you know, that we transferred some care money? 
with this, you know, like when someone is sick like this, or are we using that money? Well, m most of what we have right is, is, is just time. So, oh, okay. so it, it, you know, um, it, it's really not a, a, a specific monetary <coughs> cost, but it's just time that, that somebody, their accrued time would not be used. So. Let me make sure I understand. But we're just basically right now we're saying we're going to, we're thinking about extending it through uh, March, March 31st. Yes, sir. And then we'll basically revisit it again then? Yes, sir. Okay. We're not putting a drop in. It relates back under the proposal that's before you. It relates back to January 1, right. 2021. Gotcha. Gotcha. Right. Well, so 21. So somebody had it. Right, exactly. End of December, and you adopted this policy, they would be covered. Right. So, but we're not we're not just putting a drop dead date of March thirty first. We this no longer going to be in effect. We're going to come back and revisit it. We will come back and give you an situation. update before okay. that. Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Chair. <laughs> do understand that this program was a federal program and it is no longer in existence it ended as of december 31st what we're doing here is extending a program that nobody else that i that i'm aware of is actually extending so what you're doing is providing federal guidance in dealing with this at our expense and I, I'm, I'm just saying you're given additional benefits that the public sector doesn't have. Those requirements are gone as of December 31st. And, and I have a serious issue here that we are, in fact, going beyond our scope. Now, I was not going to object to this as long as we had an extension no more than 90 days. But what we're now talking about is revisiting it in 90 days. So it's just like any other program. You start the program, and where are you going to end it? So I think we all need to recognize that this program is adding a, a benefit that the public sector doesn't have. That we are going way beyond what our policy is. Now, get me straight here. Employees of our county have sick leave. They do have time that they can take off. So it's not a matter that we are saying you can't take your sick leave. You can. But we're going back to our normal processes of allowing earned sick leave and time off. You can take vacation days. But we cannot insulate our employees differently than the public sector. I, I, just, I, I, think, I, I think we are going way beyond what we should be doing. Well, we're already doing it in, in some cases. I mean, because the public, I mean, the public sector gets different benefits than what our county employees get. But we're, to, we're expanding the benefits greatly here. Now, I'm telling you, we're expanding them. Um, because this family, this actually allows you, if you're an employee, if I, correct me if I'm wrong here, what is the extent of the benefit? It's not that only that you get it, it what if a family member gets it? Are you not covered under that? That you don't get it but one time. I understand. And if they get I sick. As I said before, after discussing this, I withdrew my objection as long as it was extended no more than 90 days. But now we're talking about extending it or revisiting it. We don't know what the virus is going to do. I mean, if we did, I mean, we... You are talking to someone that's had the virus. I understand that. And, and, you ought to, you ought to and, and it affects people differently. Exactly. So, so, so people are dying versus you might not have had the same symptoms as somebody else. Some people are getting hospitalized where you may have not had to get hospitalized. Some people have to stay at home, can't hardly do anything, where you may have been able to move around and be fine. So you can't put the same, just because you had it, that, some, that everybody is, is, is feeling the same way that you feel. I am just uh, objecting to the fact that we are 
extending federal benefits that was on a federal level on a local level. Uh, I don't have a problem with it. We're only talking about 90 days, but we're talking about beyond that. I've got a real problem with it. Uh, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> my, my only issue would be that with that, if that's the case, then why why are we even spending it 90 days? If if, if it's a problem going to be again at 90 days of going and looking and readdressing it, why are we even doing it this 90 days? I Good mean, question. That, that that makes yeah, zero that's sense. Good question. So my thing is, you know, if we're going to do it, then we're we're going to do it another. We're going to at least come back and revisit it at that point. So because we don't know what's going to happen in 90 days, this thing could get worse. It could get 10 times worse. It could get better. We don't know. So therefore, let's do, let's do the best that we can for our employees here, regardless of whether it's private sector or public sector. You know, I mean, let's just do the best we can for our employees. The, the thought process on the 90 days was, was it is, according to the CDC, supposed to be getting worse since Christmas. Uh, hopefully, we're starting to get more shots uh, and vaccines, and Dr. Weiss will be here today to talk about the vaccines and, and the next steps and how we're doing some public uh, reach to our, our elderly. So the, the thought process is hopefully in 90 days, we will get at least a, a large majority of our, especially our frontline people, vaccinated, and then that way we can hopefully start getting back to a, a regular uh, schedule and, and a, you know, a regular understanding with most people being vaccinated who wanted to be vaccinated. What, um, Mr. Chair, um, what mechanisms will be put in place so that we know for a fact that um, the employees did test positive for COVID um, so that we're not running into someone that may say, I just want to take 10 days off. Um, what mechanisms will be in place? We, we do have uh, already uh, for the, the original program in HR that they do have to provide uh, those tests. All right, thank you. And they have to provide, if they are uh, being required to quarantine, that they have that, that doctor's name. Thank yes, you. <clears throat> Let's clarify something else too. This, this, not only we got two departments that the department heads are related just like we are. You got the sheriff's department and the rest of the deeds. And my understanding is, according to this, is that it's up, entirely up to those two department heads to whether they do this or not. Yes. Yes, sir. But then we'll kind of put the sheriff and the rest of your deeds on the spot. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, well, we, we're talking about county employees, and again, <laughs> we've got two other departments that, that either could or could not fall under this, depending on what the, that department had. Mr. I, I realize we got you got people in every profession or every organization that's going to try to abuse the system. Basically like Commissioner Williams was saying. But I mean, we got to, I mean, we got, we got to show, I'm going to use compassion, I guess is probably not the right word, but we got to show a certain amount of, of compassion for employees. I mean, if, if, you know, we don't want, you know, two people expect that they got to come to work to pay the bills, like Foster was saying, and then they infect seven others. I mean, you know, in a department. And then you've got nine out instead of two. I mean, you got to kind of think about it as a workforce, you know, issue as well. But you know, but they do have sick leave. We do have, yes, sir. Their uh, accumulated sick leave can be used as well. Once again, with sick leave, you may not feel sick, and you test positive, you know? And once you test positive, you can pass that on to someone else, and then they test positive, and then they really get sick, and they may have to take their sick leave where the other person doesn't. But if you, if you have that doctor's note and you have that saying quarantine for 10 days, that's more unlikely you're gonna stay home for those 10 days. That's just my issue. So once again, it's, it's, it's just about protecting others. I mean, you know, whether they go home and, and they give it to their family or whatever, then, you know, that's something that they have to work on within their household, you know, but right when they come to work, that's, that's our concern. And that's where we should be thinking first and thinking about the employees first and not anything else. Oh, 
I mean, just prime example. I mean, if I'm correct, I think the Duplin County Sheriff's Department had to shut their administrative offices down because of the COVID. Is that somewhere remotely correct? That's right. So, I mean, so now you've got a, a department that is shut down because of the issue, you know, to keep from spread. So, I mean, you know, we're in the business to provide services. So, I guess that's the reason we're up here. We got to make decisions that sometimes not possible. <laughs> I mean, you know, it is what it is. We're just in a new realm of unknown here. And, you know, we, we've got to protect ourselves and protect our employees. Don't we can shut down a whole department. It's just a given, like Mr. Foster said. I mean, some people might not have a lot of sick time. I don't know. Do you want to continue this discussion after 9 o'clock? Um, I, th I think we do. Yeah, well, we'll, 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 we can't take any action right now. So. Well, I know that, yes, sir. But we, yes. are, are we leaving this on the consent agenda? No. Oh, this is under presentation. Oh, it is? Under new business. Okay. This is under new business. Okay. Um, then we have public comments, county manager's report, board of commissioners, committee reports, closed session, uh, and then adjournment. Do we need a closed session today? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> well, we're going to have to get the tail end of the meeting because we are we're not, we don't have time to do it nine, ten minutes, do we? That's okay. All right. Anyone else have anything they want to add to the agenda? Okay. Let's take a ten-minute break, and we'll be back for the nine o'clock meeting.